Great to have you here. Thanks for joining us today. I want to say a quick hello to all of our campuses. Thanks for being a part of our services. Let's also give it up for our God Behind Bars guys. Thanks for watching, being a part of our services today as well. So we were planning on doing Dunk Fest, this whole baptism thing, all weekend long, but we didn't know that we were going to have like weather that came from Minnesota. We did not know that was going to happen. So it's like cold. So I'm actually changing up the sermon. If you came to get baptized today, don't get mad at me. Oh, they're canceling. I got my friends and my family here. No, you can still get baptized. You can be part of the Polar Bear Baptism Club. We're fine with that. (laughs) We're still doing baptisms today, but we also understand that most normal human beings, unlike yourself, are not going to get baptized today. So we get that. It's a little bit cold, but again, we are doing baptisms today. If you want to get baptized, I think it's awesome. I think it's great that you're not giving yourself the excuse to back out of it. I think it's awesome. So let's give it up for those who are getting baptized today at all of our campuses. I think it's great. Bold. I love it. So, But I did feel led to call an audible and change the message. And so we have actually passed out a new message. And so if you do not have the new message, uh, hopefully we have those at all the campuses too. If not, you can just simply turn over your worship guide and just simply take notes. But today's message is called Taking Jesus public. I decided to change it because it's obviously very cold outside. So, and also next week is Easter, and I just felt really led for us to understand what it really means to take Jesus public. You know, you ever heard someone say, oh man, that sweater looks good on you, right? Or that shirt looks good on you, or those shoes look good on you, or, you know, something looks good on you, right? You know, I've had people say, oh, pastor, man, that shirt looks good on you. You know, those shorts look good on you. Actually, I've never had anyone say those shorts look good on you, not even once. Because if you see my legs, you'd understand. And so... I've had people say, like, hey, there's some strings hanging down from your shorts. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, those are your legs. Sorry, I didn't realize that. <laughs> so no one has ever said those shorts look good on you. I'm just saying that's never happened. In fact, if you see my legs, actually, people think that's a miracle that you're actually able to stand on those. That's phenomenal because <laughs> there's nothing to those legs. So anyways, but yeah. But, you know, maybe someone said, you know, oh, that shirt, that blouse, that sweater, that, that jacket looks good on you, right? Let me ask you a question. Does Jesus look good on you? Does that make sense? Like the way you carry yourself, the way you handle people, the way you talk, the way you act, the way you handle situations. Does Jesus look good on you? The Bible is very clear that we're supposed to wear Jesus in a way that's honoring him and also is attractive. The Bible actually says to make the teaching of God our Savior attractive. Did you know that? And so we're supposed to be drawing people to ourselves as we draw people to who? To Jesus. And so I want to challenge you today to help me take Jesus public. It is our job to make Jesus famous. But the problem is we're so busy trying to make ourselves famous on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on you know, whatever social platform you're on. You know, and so we're so busy trying to make ourselves look cool that we forget that really our job is to make Jesus famous, not ourselves famous. So let's take Jesus public today. Pull out your notes if you would, or turn your worship guide over there and take some notes today on how to take Jesus public today. I want to give you four challenges today, four things to do that I believe will challenge you to the core of who you are. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 says this, his intent, God's intent, was it through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. So God wants to use his church. His church does not mean a church building. It's not a location. It's his people. He wants to use you and me to make the manifold wisdom of God, the truth about God, made known to the world around us. He wants the church to do that. He wants us to make an impact. And so, number one, would you write this down? I want to challenge you to commit to bringing one new person to church every week for the next month. Some of you are like, whoa, that's bold. One new person a week for the next month? I mean, that's a lot of people. That's four people, guys. That's very very doable. You call four people, ladies, when there's a sale on at Dillard's. Don't you lie to me. I know you do that, girl. You better get down here. I'm telling you right now, they got a sale. I mean, I'm telling you. We tell four people about our favorite burger place, right? We're like, oh man, the burgers are awesome. You got to try this, right? And so, you know, we are product evangelists all the time. We're always telling people about our favorite product, whatever that happens to be. In the same way, God wants us to be evangelist for him, telling other people about Christ. I believe there are more people willing to come to church with you than you're willing to invite. I'm convinced of this. There's more people willing to come to Christ than we're willing to tell about Christ. And so God wants to use us to reach out to those around us. Oh, but pastor, I don't know the words to say. Well, try this. Ready? Hey, you want to come to church with me this weekend? 
That's pretty simple, isn't it? You can even write that down if it's confusing for you, right? Hey, do you want to come to church with me this weekend? It's simple, right? Well, what if they say no? Ask the next person next to them. What if they say no? Ask someone else. What if they say no? Ask them. Keep asking until someone says yes. You know, this is really not different than sales. Some of you are in sales, right? You're like, four people a month. I could never bring four people to church in a month. If you didn't sell four Hondas in a month, you'd get fired. People are used to quotas all the time with work. And so four people in one month, is very doable. How do you get four people? You invite 20, and four will say yes. Actually, I think really if you invite five or six, four will say yes. Really, truthfully, I want to challenge you to bring someone next week. In fact, next week's the easiest weekend of all to bring someone. It's Easter. Everyone's going to church on Easter. I mean, it's the thing to do, right? I just want to challenge you to bring someone with you to church next week, but also bring someone with you the next week. The next week after that, the week after that. Take a moment, would you right now, just write four names down, just as they come to mind. I mean, this should be kind of easy. You're like, all right, I can bring Kool-Aid and Roro, and I can bring, you know. <laughs> just write four names down real quick. Some people you know you can bring to church with you. It's spring break. Some of you just need to just party all night and just drive on into church after that. I mean, <laughs> some of you probably did that. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> was he there? Did he see me? I want to challenge you to bring someone to church this weekend with you to, 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 to Easter. It's a great week to bring someone. Luke chapter 14, 23 says this, Go out into the country and urge anyone you find to come in so that my house will be full. Did you know God wants a full house? He, see, an empty seat to God's a big deal. He wants every seat full at every campus. He wants us to reach out that much to people around us and bring them to church with us. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says this, you will be my witnesses. It doesn't say, if you feel like it, you can be my witnesses. It doesn't say, when you get your life together, you can be my witnesses. No, it says, just be my witnesses. It doesn't say, you have to, you have, to have your life perfect. Well, whenever I don't have any sin in my life, then I'll bring someone. Well, then you never will. Because we're always going to have sin in our lives. We're always going to have struggles. We're always going to have difficulties. Well, whenever I'm not so busy. But you're always going to be busy. Well, whenever I'm not so broke. You're probably going to be broke a lot. <laughs> Sorry. I hate to break it to you, right? I mean, the truth is, is that if you're waiting to always give yourself an excuse as to why you're not going to bring someone to church, you never will. you got to set, set aside your excuses and say, you know what, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to bring someone to church with me this week. And I want to challenge you to do that. Just simply bring someone with you. In fact, I want to, I want to encourage you. First of all, you should be going to a church you're not embarrassed of, that you are willing to bring people because you're, you're cool with it. You're like, you know, I think they're going to like my church. You know, I'm pretty proud of our church, actually. I think God is really doing something powerful in all of our campuses. And so now I'm a little bit biased, I admit, but I believe God's really moving here. And so I, I think we have, we have a good reason to bring someone to church. I really do believe that, you know. Every once in a while, my kids will say, one of my kids will say, you know, Dad, church wasn't that cool today, you know. And I'm like, I always want to remind them, like, you should try a couple of the churches in if you don't think ours was cool. I can take you to some lame-o churches. I'm sorry, I hate to break it to you. But I've been to a few serious snoozer community church. I've been there. Have you guys know what I'm talking about? You ever been to a church like that where you're like, can't keep your eyes open to save your life? You're like, oh my goodness. This is unbelievable, right? I'm not trying to make fun of churches. I'm just telling you, I grew up in churches that were traditional. Like they would sing from, like they would use like an organ. Like, is there any other music that they use an organ in? I don't know of any, right? I have never had someone who wasn't a Christian hop in my car with me and start punching the dial and say, I'm just looking for some good organ music. Not once. <laughs> Not once, I'm telling you, right? And so we have designed church for you to bring friends and family with you. We've designed it. We, we, we speed up the tempo. I try to use a lot of humor. I always have lots of jokes because I make fun of myself, which means I never run out of material. I'm just trying to tell you. <laughs> we try to make this easy for you to come to church, and, and, and so we want to make it easy for you to come to hear a dangerous message. We believe that God wants you to bring people with you to church. I really believe that. I'm sincere about that. I, I, I'm convinced God wants us to reach out to those around us. So number one, commit to bringing one new person to church every week for the next month. 1 Corinthians 16.2 says this. This is another big deal on taking Jesus public. It says, each one of you on the first day of each week should set aside a specific sum of money in proportion to what you have earned and use it for the offering. So we're supposed to do what's called percentage giving or proportion giving. So what is the proportion? Leviticus chapter 27, 27 verse 30 says, a tenth of all you produce is the Lord's and it's holy. So God wants us to bring 10% of our income back to him. Number two, commit to tithing for one month to fund God's work. Some of you right now are like, tithe, like 10%. Tithing does not mean give, by the way. It means tithe. It means tenth. Tithe literally means one tenth. It means to give 
back to God, to bring back to God 10% of all that you earn. Some of you right now are freaking out going, there is no way, Pastor, I could give 10% of my income. That is a huge number. I understand that number seems really big, so I want to help those of you who feel like it's big right now. Here we go. Let me pray over you. God, I pray that you'd lower their income to an amount that 10% is no longer a big amount. <laughs> See, 10% is 10%. And so if you earn 200 bucks this week, then you're supposed to bring God 20 bucks. See, $20 doesn't sound that big, does it? Out of 200 Well, if you earn $2,000 this week, first of all, wow, that's awesome. Great job. That's a lot of money. You're supposed to bring God $200 out of $2,000, right? Now, if you, if you earn $20,000 this week, first question is, what do you do? Because we all want to get in on it. That's amazing. <laughs> but if you earn $20,000 this week, you're supposed to bring God $2,000. Now, does $2,000 out of $20,000 seem unreasonable? See, the point is, is that the more you earn, 10% is still 10%. But it's reasonable to bring one-tenth to God to, to honor Him. He gave you your life. He gave you your skills and abilities that, that allow you to earn money. He's one who's allowed you to have an education. He's one who allowed you to, to, to live in this country that you could have the same set of skills in another country and earn one-tenth of what you earn compared to living in America. And so I think it's very reasonable to say to God, you know what, Lord? You have blessed me. You have honored me. You've given me health, the ability to earn an income, to provide for my family, to still take a vacation every once in a while, to have some things I actually want. So, Lord, I want to bring you 10% because I want to honor you and I want to fund God's work. It's a very reasonable thing. In fact, honestly, many people have dreams that have to do with finances. Maybe, many people ha have a dream. Maybe you don't, but some of you have a dream and you say, man, if I only had the money. I mean, how many times have we said that, right? But, but God's like, well, I've put this principle in place for you to have the money. If you'll bring 10% of what you already earned to me, I will bless you over and above and beyond that, God wants to bless you with everything that you need for the dreams He has given you, but you've got to get in on His program. See, to say, God, I don't have the money to do this, but you keep giving this dream, and I don't know why, but you're not tithing. So what you're doing, when you don't tithe, you're putting your foot on the brake, and you're trying to put your foot on the gas at the same time. You're not going to go anywhere doing that. You're just spinning your wheels. And so in the same way, when you begin to tithe, when you release what's in your hand to God, God releases what's in His hand to you. Now, that's a pretty amazing deal right there, right? And so God really will bless you. Now, I realize some of you are like, Pastor, that sounds great, but you know, you're a preacher. I mean, come on, of course you're going to say that. But I was doing this long before I was a preacher. I grew up in a home that we tithed uh, every time we earned anything. I remember when I was 13 years old, my first paycheck, I got working at this little bitty air conditioning place down the street. My dad lined it up for me to be able to have a little job at 13. I used to ride my 10 speed over there, and, and then I would work for a couple hours and, uh, a week. And, and I loved that. I, I would earn a little paycheck, and I would tithe off of that, age 13. It's 16, got, got my you know, first real job. I was tithing off of that. I remember uh, tithing off of when I mowed lawns. I remember tithing off of when I, when I was in college and, and you know, had a job part-time. And then when I first got married, my first year's income was $12,000 a year. You know, I was, and I thought that was good money. And so my tithe that year was $1,200. You know, that seems like a lot of money. Well, it wasn't like I gave it all at once. I gave it every paycheck, 10%. It was very doable. And then the next year, my income went up. And guess what? I tithed off of that. $20,000 next year. Woo! 20 grand. Tithed off 20 grand. And so, and as my income continued to escalate, I continued to give. And I know you think, well, if my income escalated, your income escalates. Everyone's income escalates at some level. And so just continue to tithe as you earn more. And as God continues to bless you, you continue to tithe. And so I want to challenge you. I know some people that come to our church that now tithe what they used to earn. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? To be, able to, 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 to be able to tithe, that means, that means you're earning 10 times what you're making now. Wouldn't that be great? And so, but you got to first say, God, I want you to bless me so I can bless your work. And so you know how much ministry we want to get done that we just can't do because we just simply don't have the what? The money, the tithe. So when you begin to tithe, it changes everything. It changes everything in your personal life. It changes everything in your career and your finances and your investments. It really does change everything. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in my friend's life, my family's life. I know it can change your life as well. I want to challenge you to tithe for one month. You can do it for one month. In fact, the truth is the average American's already tithing and has been for years. Did you know the average American gives 11% of their income every single month to MasterCard? We've been tithing for years. We're just tithing to the wrong entity. The devil is stealing the tithe from the church. Why? So he can hurt God's work. But you know, the way you change that is by saying, God, I'm going to quit stealing from you. I'm going to instead bring the tithe to you. And I understand those of you who say, well, what about all those charlatans out there? What about them? What does it have to do with this church? Nothing. 
And so, and if you don't trust this church to give here, then go find a church that you do trust and give there. But I will tell you this, I wish you would ask me questions about the finances. I beg of you, please ask me where we spend it so I can talk about the mission work we're doing all over the world. So I can talk about the church plant. So I can talk about the great work we're doing in Honduras. So I can talk about all the, the children we're feeding in Haiti. Please ask me about the West Side so I can show you how many lives are changing. I wish you would ask me questions. Please ask me. Because if you see how we spend the money, you realize, wow, they are really good at utilizing the resources at this church to make an impact. You know, well, I know churches, are, you know, every time you give it, half of it's going to salaries. Not here, they're not. No, our percentages are very low here for what we spend on salaries compared to other ministries. Did you know that? The average church in America spends 50% of every penny that comes in on salaries. I have our financial officer right here in the front row. What's our percentage? 27% of what comes in here goes towards staff salaries. That's half of half. I'm just trying to help you understand. That means up to 75% of what you give is going into ministry and missions. Do you know how rare that is? I'm just trying to help you understand. We are being good stewards of what you're giving. We're squeezing every dollar to use it for God's work. And there's nothing wrong, by the way, with paying people to do great work for God, too. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not embarrassed of that. But what I'm trying to say is we stretch that dollar as thin as we can to make an impact. Ask any of our vendors. They're like, oh, yeah, they stretch that dollar. They're always asking us for the best deal we can. Absolutely, without apology. Why? We're trying to stretch that dollar. Why? We want to be good stewards of what you have given so we can do more for God's work every single day. When you give, you are giving to a mean, lean evangelism machine here at Church Unlimited. We're changing lives every single day. It's a big deal. And so when you fund God's work, God funds you. When you release what's in your hand to God, God releases what's in his hand to you. So I want to challenge you to commit to tithing for one month. You can do it for one month. I want to challenge you to do that. In fact, honestly, I'm going to tell you the truth right now. We're behind financially as a church right now. We, we are. In fact, if we stayed on pace at the current level we are, we would be behind by the end of the year a million dollars. That's a lot of resources. That's a lot of missions that won't happen. That's a lot of ministry that won't happen. Now, do I believe it's going to happen? No, because I know you well enough to know that when I bring it to you, you step up, because that's the kind of people you are. But I want to challenge you to just let you know on the front end, we're not where we need to be. I want to challenge you to step up, to begin to make a difference, to begin to make an impact. I understand. Oh, but Pastor, you know the oil's down. I know we took that into account already. We've already adjusted our budget. So we're asking you just to stay faithful. Does that make sense? So I want to challenge you to begin to fund God's work. You know, if you were to take a business public, you would do what? You'd go find some venture capitalists to help you capitalize your, your business. You could do what? You could take a public. To take Jesus public, we need some Christian venture capitalists to invest in God's work so we can take Jesus public. Does that make sense? It takes resources. And so I want to challenge you to give to God's work so we can make an impact. And anyone who has a problem with that, to be honest with you, is wearing a sandwich board today that says, I'm selfish. I'm just telling you the truth. There's no reason for you to have a problem with tithing. Because if you're giving to a place that's, that has integrity, that's honoring God with the resources, then, see, the reason why I'm not embarrassed to ask is because I'm not embarrassed where the money's going. I'd be very embarrassed to ask if, if we were being bad with the money. But don't let some charlatans out there on television or some church you used to go to that, that mishandled the money keep you from giving to a place that handles money well. Does that make sense? And so don't use that as your excuse to disobey God. I want to challenge you to give faithful. Trust me, nothing makes me more mad. You're, there's no way you're more mad than I am when I watch some TV preacher abuse the, the, the principle of bringing the tithe. I don't like it either. In fact, it's just like, it's like if you ask a good cop what they think about bad cops, they're more mad at them than you'll ever be because it makes what they do look bad. So I'm the same way. I'm like, I cannot stand charlatan preachers that try to use this principle just to get rich off people. That is wrong. It makes me sick. Trust me, I have a much stronger opinion about that than you do. But this is not that kind of place. We're making an impact. We're changing lives every single day. I want to challenge you without apology to give to the Lord's house, to support God's work, to commit to tithing for one month to fund God's work. Look at John 15, 5. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Wow, that's very strong, isn't it? He says, you don't hang out with me, you can do great things. You don't hang out with me, you're not going to do much. There's a lot of people that are trying to do the Lord's work without the Lord. It doesn't work like that. It's not supposed to work like that. God wants us to stay connected to him. Look at 2 Peter 1. 
Verse 3, it says, For as you know him better and better, God will give you through his great power everything you need for living a truly good life. He has promised to save us and to give us his own character. You know, God says, if you'll stay connected to me, I'll give you everything you need. You know, can I tell you something right now? You already have everything you need to do what you're supposed to do. You already do. You have all the resources you need to do what you're supposed to do. You just don't, you're not tapping into the resources if you're not spending time with God. I want to challenge you to do something very simple as well. Number three, I want to challenge you to commit to a devotional time every weekday for one month. Not every day, every weekday. That's, that's five times a week. I want to challenge you to commit to a devotional time with God just five times a week. And some of you are like, oh, man, Pastor, I've tried that. It's really hard. I don't really know what I'm doing. I mean, can you recommend a good book? Is there, is there like a certain resource that you'd recommend? And yes, I want to recommend a really good book to you. This is a really powerful one. It's called The Bible. I think you'll really like it. I recommend the Bible because it's actually God's Word. It's not, a, it's not from an author writing about God's Word. It is God's Word, and I recommend it. And I'm not trying to insult you, but to be honest with you, there's a lot of Christians who are not reading the Word of God. And so if you'll get into the Word of God, it's a very powerful thing. Let me, let me help you, though, because I understand that you need a good on-ramp, right? Because if, if you just jump right onto it, sometimes you can get into the wrong section of Scripture. Now, there's no wrong section. I don't mean like it's bad, but it can be very complicated, right? You ever tried to read in Leviticus, right, or Deuteronomy, and you're like, okay, I don't know what all that means. That was just confusing. Whoa, that's crazy, right? And you start in Revelation. Now you're scared to death. You can't even sleep at night. I mean, like, wow, this is crazy. And so there are certain on-ramp locations that are easier accessible, right? So my middle guy, my middle son, Cole, is starting to drive now. So just I'm preparing you now. Just be aware of wherever you are that he is on the road. So he's with me in the car, So, but that's not necessarily good because I'm not paying attention at the time, but I'm supposed to be. So I'm in the passenger seat. He's in the driver's seat, which means we're both screaming at equal you know, volume. But anyways, as he drives, you know, he, he's learning that there's certain levels that you go to. Like, So the first thing we did is we went to a parking lot and just learned to drive in the parking lot, right? We kind of went slow, nice and easy, and that's where we started. Then we went from that to just, I would, I would actually pull in their neighborhood, pull over, and then we'd change out, and then Cole would drive us from the entrance of our neighborhood all the way to the house, right? So he just learned kind of neighborhood driving, right? And then we went from there to going to the store and back. And then eventually we did the big stuff and went straight to a highway, right? And that was the scariest part. Just the other day, we went, we went on the highway, and it was the funniest thing ever. He was scared out of his mind. It was so funny. He was like, dad, 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 dad. And I was just like, relax, relax. You're going to be okay. It's fine, right? He was scaring me to death. Like, stop doing that. You're scaring me. <laughs> stop. And so he was nervous, though. But, but here's the funny thing. The other day he drove. I'm so proud of him. He drove all the way from San Antonio to Corpus Christi. He drove the whole time. He did a great. I was really proud of him. Now, here's the thing. The scariest part was not the highway. The scariest part was the on-ramp to the highway, right? It's like getting, going from 20 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour. That's when he was just going, ah, 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 ah. And then we got on, and he was fine, right? Then he was like, okay, just stay in your lane, keep the pace, we're good, right? Then he was fine. It's the on-ramp. Can I give you a few on-ramps to the Word of God real quick? Let me give you one that's really great, Proverbs. I love the Proverbs on-ramp. Did you know there's 31 of them? That's exactly how many days there are in a month. There's, I promise you there's not 32. There's 31 days in a month, and there's 31 Proverbs. So what you can do is any t- particular day, you just say, what's today's date? And then pull open that Proverbs. It's a great way to get in the Word of God, right? Some of you have been trying that or, or maybe been doing that for years. You're like, I need something else. Okay, how about Psalms? You know, Psalms is just David. It's just King David's journal. He basically is giving you his devotion. And I love David's devotions because they're just funny. Sometimes you read them and you're like, this is hilarious. I mean, David would like say some things. And you're like, wow. I mean, that's just downright funny because he would just, he was so brutally honest that like early in this devotional, he would say like, God, kill all my enemies. He would just say that. I'm like, well, there you go. That's how I feel sometimes too, right? <laughs> the other day, the Lakers played the Rockets and just whooped them. And I was just like, I just want to pray. God, just kill all Laker fans. Just kill them all. <laughs> but then by the end of David's you know, journal time that day, he would be like, never mind, Lord, don't do that. Just make me a better godly man, right? So that's like, he kind of comes around like, kill all Lakers fans. Okay, don't actually kill them. I mean, maybe I just need to change my attitude, whatever. <laughs> It's going to like come around by the end, you know, I love that because that's how all of us are, isn't it? And so basically he's like, you know, you start off with the wrong attitude, then we come to God and God begins to adjust us, right? Change us and then we're better, more like Christ by the end. 
So that's David. So maybe you want to read a Psalms. You know, that, that, that's a great one, too. I know a guy that planted a church, and, and he was a pastor. He started a church uh, in California, in Southern California. And so he went to start it, and this guy showed up one day and was like, every week he would say, hey, pastor, can I read a poem today? And he was just like, no, we don't do that here at our church. And so finally, about the third week, the guy was like, I just want to read a poem. I, I really, and he was like, no, look, 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 you weirdo. I know we're in California, but you don't read poems in church. What are you doing? He was like, no, I love Psalm 23. It's a great one. It's about the Lord's my shepherd. And he's like, no, it's called Psalms. We don't read palms here at Church Unlimited either, but we do read psalms. It's great, though, because it's just David's devotional. Here's another one. Here's one of my favorite on-ramps to the Bible, the book of Mark. Here's what's great about the book of Mark, by the way. The book of Mark is like the ESPN highlights of Jesus' ministry. It's like, and now Jesus goes and heals someone. dun 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 dun, dun. And he just talks about that real quick, and he goes on to the next one. I love that about the book of Mark, because you can't get lost or confused. It's just very simple, like... And then he went and called the disciples. And then he went and healed someone. And then he fed 4,000. And then he, you know, just, you're like, boom, boom, boom. Got it. It's just, it's the highlight version of Jesus' ministry. And so it's a great one to start with. And so I would not start in Deuteronomy. There's nothing wrong with Deuteronomy, but, you know, it's a little heavy. I wouldn't start in Leviticus. I wouldn't start in Job, that's for sure. I mean, oh, my goodness. Oh. You know, there's certain books that you just you need to know that, you know, you don't start there. But you, you, can, you can on-ramp there, but that's just not where you start. You don't go from zero to 60 for the first time you've ever driven, right? You, you go easy, right? So Psalms, Proverbs, Book of Mark, great entry points. But get into the Word of God. You know what I love about the Word of God? When I begin to read the Word of God, it begins to read me. You have noticed that about the Word of God? It's powerful like that. I was just sitting here looking at the Word of God earlier today. Let me, let me see. By the way, just if you take your Bible, you just fold it like this, you, you close it, and just open to the halfway point, and you're just about in Psalms or Proverbs every time. In fact, I, I just want to, let, let's go and do the first day together. How's that sound? Does that sound cool? We can get the first day done together? Okay. So yeah, let's do that right now. So I'm going to turn to Psalms 149. Uh, it's a great one. It says, praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the saints. So that's where we are. We're in the assembly of the saints together, right? Then he says this, let Israel rejoice in their, ma- in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them, pr- be, uh, let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and harp, or in our case, electric guitar. <laughs> For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with salvation. You know he takes delight in you? He delights in who you are. Did you know that? We're supposed to delight in him, but you know he delights in you. He thinks you're awesome. That's what he thinks about you. He thinks you're funny. He thinks you're cool. He likes you. Did you know that he likes you? Isn't it nice to know that even if someone doesn't like you, the Lord likes you? He takes delight in you. He really does. He delights in you. I think right now the Lord right now is like, come here, angels. Come here. Here's my ADD preacher again in Corpus. Listen to him. He's funny. <laughs> he delights in his people. He does. He's like, how spiky his hair is. I made it like that. He won't go down. <laughs> he delights in his people. It's okay. I, go, I know you're laughing at me. That's fine. It says, let the saints rejoice in, in, this, in this honor and, and sing for joy on their beds. So even at night. We should be singing to God. He says, Make the, may the praise of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands. Oh, that's talking about the word of God. This is a double-edged sword. Maybe you have a problem you got to fight. And you, you're like, Pastor, i got to fight in my hand. Then put your sword out. This will help you fight your battles. Did you know that? Let's go on. It says this, to inflict vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters, their nobles with shackles of iron, to carry out the sentence written against them. This is the glory of all his saints, praise the Lord. You know, God gets glory when you fight the battle you're in with the word of God. So there, you finished your first psalm, your first palm for today. So congratulations, you just had your time with God. Isn't that good? Simple. So simple. Simple. You can get into the Word of God. It really will change your life. It has changed mine. I know it can change yours too. So commit, number three, to a devotional time every weekday for one solid month. It really will change you. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, when the council saw the boldness of Peter and John, they were amazed and realized what being with Jesus had done for them. Peter and John just wore Jesus well. When they hung out with Jesus, you could literally tell they were hanging out with him. See, the first day that you don't spend time with God, God, God knows and he can tell. The second day you don't spend time with God, those close to you can tell. The third or fourth day, everyone knows it. They're like, yeah, I mean, they're a Christian, but they're not walking with them. But when you begin to walk with Jesus, people start to take notice. You start to realize, now, there's someone that's walking with God. There's someone honoring the Lord. When, when you really walk with the Lord, 
people take notice. Commit to a devotional time every weekday for one month. You can do this. And last of all, look at 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 2. It says, to the church, we always thank God for you and pray for you constantly. John 15, 7 says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish and you shall have it. Whoa, back it up. What did I just say? Ask for anything you wish and you will have it? Okay, God, I wish for a promotion. I wish for a raise. I wish for a girlfriend or boyfriend, right? I'm talking to single people here. No, I'm not talking about those who are married. That's not good. <laughs> right, but we, if you ask God for something, if you're walking with him, he says, you'll have it. There's nothing I won't give you if you're honoring me. Wow. He says, in this way, you become my disciples. Number four, commit to praying for your friends, family, and community to find Christ every day for one month. When's the last time you prayed for someone to know Jesus? When's the last time you prayed for someone to know Jesus? You know, it's funny, I just had Pastor Ed come back. He's one of our pastors on staff here. He's a retired minister. He's still on staff. Great guy. He came, came to me. He said, you know, Pastor, I love what you said about praying for lost people. He goes, we keep all these Christians turning these prayer requests, and they're praying for all the sick Christians to keep them out of heaven. Like, so they don't die. He said, what we need to be praying for is lost people to get into heaven. I was like, well, that's a great insight right there. Isn't that good? I'm all for praying for sick people, too. There's nothing wrong with that, but we need to be praying for the ultimate sickness, people who don't know Jesus, so that they can get into heaven. This week, I want to challenge you to pray for those four names that you wrote down. Hopefully, you wrote down four already. Kool-Aid and Row, the first two, right? And pray for the other ones, too. We need to pray for them that they would come to church and, and be saved, that their lives would be changed. So what we're saying, number four, is to commit to praying for your friends, family, and community. In other words, talk to God about your friends before you talk to your friends about God. When's the last time you really prayed for someone that they would know Jesus, that they would accept Christ in their life? We should be praying for the lost. This week is a great week to bring someone. It's Easter, and people are going to be coming to church anyways. 35 to 40% of America goes to church on any Sunday. On Easter weekend, it jumps to 80 to 85%, which means that all the people who normally say no will normally say no, but not next weekend. They'll say yes. So you have an opportunity to bring someone to your church. So I want to challenge you to pray for them and then go invite them. And if you'll do that, I believe God will use you to change someone's life. God may use you this week to help someone get to heaven. And last time I checked, our job as a church is to do what? To take as many people to heaven as we can before we die, period. That's what we're all about as a church. And so now we have an opportunity to do what? To take Jesus public. That is our job. No good. Now, for those of you who we were able to get notes to, and I apologize if you were not one of those people, would you take on your notes there's a little tear off section? Just tear off the bottom portion there, and you can commit to these four commitments. And just say, okay, Lord, I'm going to do this. I'm going to commit right now. I'm going to commit to praying for and bringing the following people to church with me. Four people, just write four names down. I'm also going to commit to spending time with God every day and then bringing the tithe, the full biblical tithe, the 10% to God and just sign and date it. You can drop that in the offering bucket as it goes by just a moment. You say, I'm going to make this commitment. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put it out there right now, Lord. I'm willing to do this. I'm willing to turn this in. I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow you because I believe this may be God jump-starting you. This wasn't even my sermon for today. God gave me this message this morning 10 minutes before I came out here. Called an audible. I had no prep time. So if God just used this, it wasn't anything I did. That's the Lord. Isn't God good like that? He just has something for you today. Would you take a moment and bow your heads, every head bowed, every eye closed? Would you just take a moment to pray right now? I believe Jesus wants us to take him public. How do you do that? We've laid it out very clearly. You invite someone. You bring them. You fund the work of God. You get in God's word. And you pray for your lost friends and your family members. Your head bowed and your eyes closed. If you've never received Christ, you can pray and receive Christ right now. In fact, we're going to pray this prayer out loud together for those who've never prayed it so you can know that Jesus is in your heart. Would you pray this prayer with me? You can just say, Dear Jesus, I realize I need you. I believe you died on the cross for me. And I believe you rose again. I ask you to come into my heart. Change me from within. Be my Lord 
and be my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In your name we pray. Amen. Isn't God good? His word is so true.